Hi, I'm Patrick Dunnikin. At Gibbons, we believe that citizens need to be informed about the complex issues that affect their lives. That's why we're proud to support the programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Funding for this edition of Think Tank with Steve Adubato has been provided by the law firm of Gibbons PC, Hackensack Meridian Health, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, PSENG, committed to providing safe, reliable energy now and in the future. International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, NJM Insurance Group, and by Keystone Mountain Lakes Regional Council of Carpenters. Your future is in our building. Promotional support provided by NJ.com, Small News, Big News, True Jersey, and by Insider NJ. Welcome to Think Tank. I'm Steve Adubato. Um, we are honored to have the Attorney General of the great state of New Jersey, Gravier Graywall. Um, good to have you with us. Great to be back with you, Steve. You've been on um, our other, our sister program, State of Affairs. Think Tank has a more national focus. But I'm going to ask you something right out of the box. Sure. You were on, when I say our, our partners here at NJTV, NJTV News, just the other night. You were at a forum that was held dealing with hate, hate crimes the increase of people who are involved in hate groups. How bad is, dare I simply call it, Attorney General, the hate problem in our society? It's bad, Steve. You know, if we look at data, and I'm a big believer in tracking this by the data, if we go back to 2017, we had about 549 reported incidents of bias and hate in this state. If we go to 2018, that number goes to 569. So a slight bump, but that's up from prior years. If we look year to date this year, were over 700 incidents of bias and hate reported to law enforcement. But that's not even the most troubling trend. I mean, that spike is troubling, but the biggest problem that I'm seeing is the uptick in youth bias incidents. Youth? Youth. Why do you think that is? I don't know the answer to that. I think it, it, part of it is the climate that we're living in. I think the tone that's set at the top really has unleashed a lot of this and top normalized. Of what? Top of government, Steve. Why don't we deal with it? So, okay, I mean, let's put it on the table. Yeah. I mean, you know, when you have people at the highest echelons of power, when you have the president bullying people, when you have him engaging in dehumanizing people, I think it gives license to others to do the same thing, and kids pick up on it. But, you know, uh, Attorney General, there are a lot of people watching, or a significant number of people watching, saying, what are you talking about? The president just says what he thinks. He's not bullying people. He's not uh, being mean-spirited to people. It's, you know, and a lot of folks in Jersey, or some will say, come on, in Jersey, that's the way we are. Yeah. You don't see it that way. I don't, because I think it normalizes behavior. I think words, that comments do lead to conduct. And I think what was once relegated to the dark corner of the Internet is now in our public squares. I never thought in my lifetime that I would see something like Charlottesville. I never thought I would see people yelling, Jews will not replace us on a college campus. I never thought that I would see swastikas on the walls of elementary schools. And I never thought that I would see 46% of the known offenders in New Jersey last year being minors. 46% of the known offenders and bias incidents being minor. So I have to do something about it. So let's do Charlottesville for a second. When sure. you heard there are good people from the president, quote, not paraphrasing, you know, there are good people on both sides. You felt and thought what? I thought there's no equivalency here, that you can't make an equivalence between those who are are propagating hate and those are protesting against it. You know, violence on either side is wrong, but to normalize that hate speech and normalize that language, that's the problem. I think it's drawn people out of the shadows. You know, the internet's a big part of it, but those folks are now just feeling more and more comfortable because the president's given them license to take this to the streets. One more quick one on this. You, I'm sure you try not to have your personal concerns, issues, things, whatever we have personally. Yeah. You know, it's not my job to bring my personal stuff into this studio, public broadcasting. Mm -hmm. It's not your job to bring your personal stuff into your job as attorney general, a much more important job. Yeah. However, you understand and have been affected by this on a very personal level. 
I've been on the receiving end of, of hate and bias my whole life. I've developed a very thick skin for this, but I've also developed an empathy because I know how those wounds can cut very deeply. What was said about you, excuse me, Attorney General, what was said about you, we've had talked this conversation before, and I, I know you yeah. don't want to go back and talk about it. What was said about you on a major radio station in this, in this state, 101.5, about you, your ethnic background, and your physical appearance? Well, I mean, they said that uh, they didn't remember my name, and because they couldn't remember my name, they would just relegate me to the most visible symbol of my religion, my turban, and call me Turban Man. Uh, I do think over the last 20 months, they now know my name, because I think we're taking a strong stance here against bias and hate. And, and going back to the young people, Steve, sure. that's what it's all about, right? When you have radio normalizing this type of conduct, when you have the president normalizing this conduct, hate's a learned behavior. And, and I go back to what Nelson Mandela said. He said, if people are not born hating another person, they're not born hating another person because of the color of their skin, their religion, or their background. People learn to hate. And if they can learn to hate, they can be taught to love, because love comes easier to the human heart than its opposite. And that's what we're doing in this state with our DOE, with our Division on Civil Rights. We're getting out into the schools to push back against this. If you're listening to us on the audio side, radio side, Grabeer Graywall, who is the um, Attorney General in the state of New Jersey, one more on President Trump. You have challenged President Trump from a legal point of view in the courts, if I'm not mistaken, on a variety of fronts. Some of those most relevant and significant fronts are? Environmental protection, our coastline, we push back against efforts to open up the Atlantic to offshore drilling. Our shore gives us so much, and when they wanted to open up the Atlantic to offshore drilling and give Florida a pass, we stood up and we pushed back, and they, they stopped. We pushed back on, on when they attacked the rights of immigrants, our DACA recipients. Consumer Hold on, back up. Do the immigration thing, break it down, because a lot of folks may not know what DACA is. Go ahead. DACA is a program by which we invited our dreamers out of the shadows, people who were here through no fault of their own, who were living in the shadows. We said, if you follow certain rules, you can work, you can go to school, you can contribute. Then this administration wanted to upend that program. People who we said, you know, you could play by these rules and you could be Meaning afforded. their parents were not citizens, but those children were born here. Either not born, they weren't born here, because if they were, they would be citizens. They were brought here through no fault of their own. They're and the dreamers. They're the dreamers. That's right. And so when. And what do we promise them? We promise them that if you abided by certain rules, that you can work, that you can go to school, that you can live outside the shadows and contribute to society. And then this administration wanted to upend all those guarantees. So we went down to Texas and we pushed back against the administration and we won a temporary reprieve for our dreamers in this state so they can continue for the time being to live their lives. Um, it's interesting. You've talked about this before also on NJTV News. Uh, go on the NJTV News website and check this out. A lot of reporting, I believe, by our colleague Michael Hill on this. Police, suicide, a high percentage, a significant, a dangerous and scary percentage, Attorney General uh, Graywall, who are um, victims of suicide. What does that have to do with the Attorney General's office? Well, I'm the chief law enforcement officer of this state. I've been a, a career prosecutor for most of my legal career. And, and I've worked with our, our federal agents, uh, state law enforcement. And I've seen how hard they work and the danger they put themselves at to protect us. And, and what we've seen in this state is that line of duty deaths are a serious problem, but now suicide has overtaken line of duty deaths in this state as the number one killer of law enforcement. And that's true across the country. So as a chief law enforcement officer, it's my responsibility to give our cops all the tools they need to do their job safely. That means vests, that means guns, but it also means dealing with those internal threats, the trauma that they see when they go to a homicide, the trauma that they see at a domestic violence incident, the trauma that they see at an overdose uh, reversal. They bring that home with them. And we expect- what's, Excuse me, what's that new program? Is the resiliency program? It's what a resiliency it program. So, I'm, so they bring that home with them. And so to, to stem the tide of officer suicide, We've established resiliency program officers in every police department in this state. So if a cop has an issue, they can go to the RPO in their department or in any the department. The RPO is? The resiliency program officer okay. in their department or any department in the state. Because we know there's still a stigma associated with seeking help. And so we wanted to break down those barriers. So if you don't feel comfortable going to the Nutley Police Department, go to the uh, North Caldwell Police Department. If you don't feel comfortable there, go anywhere but get help. That's part of it, getting them help without stigma. But resiliency is also a way of thinking. Yeah. So we're giving them the tools to, to overcome adversity and spiral up instead of spiraling down. We've been talking to the Attorney General of the great state of New Jersey, Gravier Graywall. Um, stay right there. Think Tank. We'll be right back right after this. 
To watch more Think Tank with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. Welcome back to Think Tank. We're talking to the Attorney General, great state of New Jersey, Gravira Graywall. Um, guns. Can we talk about guns? And what is the role, again, of the Office of the Attorney General dealing with? Is it the reduction of guns? I mean, gun laws are what they are nationally in the state, but what is it that your office is doing? So, you know, again, I'm the chief law enforcement officer in this state, and so it's up to me to come up with a comprehensive public safety strategy when it comes to reducing gun violence. And so we're using all the tools of our office, that oversight over law enforcement, law enforcement direction for our state police, to focus on this issue for what it is, and that's a public health crisis when we talk about gun violence. So we're working on prevention, treatment, and enforcement. Prevention means enforcing those gun mm -hmm. laws, making sure people who should not have guns because of Issues that they might have in their background, either criminal history or other health issues, mental health issues, should not get firearms. Excuse me. Are they, are you referring to red flag laws? That's part of it. Well, That's, explain what that means. Because people hear the expression, they're not sure what it means. So we have in this state something called an extreme risk protective order that the legislature and the governor gave to us. It's a tool that we've never before had. And that's if someone presents a danger to themselves or to others, a law enforcement officer can now petition a court to remove those weapons initially temporarily and then seek a final removal, or a family member can do that. Previously, only domestic violence victims, or we'd have to go through the criminal process to remove those weapons from a dangerous situation. Sure. And, and if they get through that dangerous situation, they can get those weapons back. But it's, it's something to make sure that someone who's presenting as a danger to themselves has tripped a red flag, you know, that a court can then determine that those guns should not be there for the time being. Let's shift gears. Opioid crisis. Um, Operation Helping Hand is? That's something I started when I was a county prosecutor, Stephen Bergen. It's a diversion program. Uh, I saw that as a county prosecutor, far too many people were getting stuck in that cycle of arrest, overdose. And we wanted to make sure that we got to them before that next Narcan save to prevent that next fatal overdose. So when people get arrested, low-level drug offenders, as a county prosecutor, I wanted to divert them to treatment. And I wanted them to get help in that moment of need. Mm. And it worked when I was a county prosecutor. When I became AG, I started rolling it out across the state. Now we're in all 21 counties. Let me, let me shift gears on this end. Uh, I've been curious about this. Um, if you go on our website, you'll see some of these past public service announcements. Um, the whole question of Insurance fraud. There's an office of insurance fraud, if I'm not mistaken, correct? There, there is. We okay. have an, uh, Tracy Thompson's our insurance yeah, and fraud. And we work with Tracy. Check, sorry for interrupting. You check out our website, you'll see Tracy. We've actually talked about this before, and we've had some public service announcements that we've used about this. I'm trying to figure out, help folks understand again, what is the issue around insurance fraud A and B? Why is the Attorney General's office involved in that as well? We're involved in a lot of things, but we get involved in insurance fraud uh, from the criminal side. So if people are filing false claims or they're taking advantage of, of the system, whether it's you know taking advantage of, of, of programs to rebuild after Sandy or filing false claims with their medical uh, insurance provider uh, to seek uh, opioids, maybe in a drug-seeking uh, manner, pill mills, sure. things like that, you know we get involved to, to both make sure that the doctors aren't doing this, going back to the opioid crisis, but the, uh, the patients are not taking advantage of their insurance provider. So it's, it's to cut out waste, fraud, and abuse uh, in insurance. Catholic Church. Yep. The ongoing investigations, the crisis, the horrific things that have happened over many, many decades, as, as a Roman Catholic, as a former altar boy, as someone who went to Catholic grammar school, high school, and college, it was around me for a lot of years. Many of the priests and Christian brothers who taught me, not many, some of them have been prosecuted. Some have not for what we believe they had done. More importantly, your office leading the effort along with Pennsylvania and some other states, what is the task force you're involved in and what does it have to do with the abuse of children by some Catholic priests? So this was born out of the, the report that came out of Pennsylvania, like you mentioned. Uh, Pennsylvania did a deep dive on this issue. Were they the first? Uh, I think they were one of the first, if not okay. the first. But they did a comprehensive eight or 900-page grand jury report uh, outlining what they found when they looked into the records of, of the Catholic Church in, in Pennsylvania. And they, what they found was troubling. They found a history of moving predator priests around from church to church to church after allegations popped up. And they found uh, cover-ups uh, of abuse. And they tried to hold folks accountable where they could, but there were issues with the statute of limitations. Excuse me, Attorney General, does that include, when you use the term cover-up, does that include 
payments that are made to victims and their families combined with um, gag orders where these folks cannot speak. No, I'm talking about cover-ups in the sense of, you know, they, there was an allegation of abuse brought to a person in authority, and rather than investigate it, they just took the predator priest out of that church and moved him somewhere else. So nothing else. happened nothing, with that priest? Yeah, in many cases, nothing happened, and they were allowed to abuse other children in other churches. That prompted us to take action because from that report, we knew some of those priests came through New Jersey. So we established our clergy abuse task force, a hotline. It went off the, uh, the ringer was just, uh, the phones were off the hooks for, for the first number of months. And so we are following up on every claim or, or allegation that comes to us. And we're holding folks accountable. We've got new tools from our legislature that have expanded some of the statute of limitations. Uh, we've already uh, held two uh, priests uh, accountable criminally. But at the end of this, we're going to issue a report, and it's going to lay bare what we found. It's going to show if there were cover-ups, if the institutions were involved, who was involved. It'll be accountability at the end of the day, and we're going to make it easier for survivors to come forward. I've got about a minute left. I want to make sure of something. I've said this. This is the fifth time I've said this. Once again, our production team at the Caucus Educational Corporation has made a request not only to have the Archbishop um, of the Diocese of Newark, the largest in the state, but other dioceses throughout the state come on either Think Tank or State of Affairs or one-on-one, -on -one, any one of our programs, to talk about this from their perspective. To date, we have not been able to secure such an interview, allegedly because of scheduling. It's been about a year and a half now. Finally, the term rule of law is talked about a lot in Washington. What does that mean to you? The, the rule of law to me means adhering to those norms and standards that have underpinned our democracy for centuries now. And what we're seeing in Washington is that those norms are being ignored and flouted and that the rule of law is under attack. And so it's incumbent on me and other state AGs to push back, and we have been pushing back. And I want to make one thing clear. We're not reflexively against any administration or any policy. We only stand up if what the administration is doing violates the law and if it affects New Jersey. And increasingly, we're answering yes to both those questions. That's when we file litigation to stand up for consumers or stand up for the environment in New Jersey or stand up for immigrant families in New Jersey or stand up for students who are fighting against uh, loan companies who are taking advantage of them. That's parties, our metric. Parties are relevant? Parties are relevant. Okay. We're holding anyone accountable in this state and, and federally if they're violating the, the whole law and affecting New Jersey. Think Tank has been joined by the Attorney General in uh, New Jersey, Grabeer. Gray Walmer, thank you for joining us and covering so many important, relevant topics that affect our lives every day, even if we may not see it that way. My, my honor. Thank you. My honor. Steve Adubato, this is Think Tank. We'll be right back. To watch more Think Tank with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. We are honored to be joined by an old friend, still young, but an old friend, uh, former state senator um, Ray Lesniak, who is the author of a compelling book called Beating the Odds, the epic battle that brought legal sports betting across America and also the founder and president of the Lesniak Institute for American Leadership. Good to see you, Ray. Great to be here, Steve. We have history. We've talked That's about a whole range of issues, but there is no debating that you were the leader of this effort to bring sports betting to this state court battles, political battles, public perception battles. Biggest lesson you take from that is? Never give up. I lost eight times uh, <laughs> in court and never listen to anyone who says there's no way that you can win this case. So, and they um, said that a lot. Oh, yeah. I, I, had, I had one supporter, Dennis Drazen from Monmouth Racetrack. Who now, uh, by the way, check our interview with Dennis. Um, when you were doing this, why were you convinced that New Jersey had to have legalized sports betting? Because Atlantic City was tanking and our, our racetracks were ready to close. So we already had lost 15,000 jobs in Atlantic City. And I saw this as a way to bring younger folks into Atlantic City and into our horse racing industry. By the way, our horse racing industry is under, underrated in the state. Mm. We have more horse farms, acres of horse farms in New Jersey than any state in the country. So um, we're talking thousands of jobs. But kind great. of revenue. Uh, Senator Lesniak, let me ask you, sure. kind of revenue are we talking about? How long have we been into this so far as we tape this program? We're just going into the Thanksgiving season 2019 as we tape. How much money are we talking? Uh, just a little over a year. But we're, for the state, Go it's, ahead. it's not that big a money raiser, a few hundred million dollars. Still, but, still real bucks. But over 10,000 jobs. Wow. And that, that's additional revenue. And it saved Atlantic City. From, uh, from another casino closing, 
two casinos have reopened. Atlantic City, uh, Monmouth Racetrack was going to close, and ultimately the Meadowlands. So it's a significant uh, uh, improvement and attraction uh, uh, to bring uh, those businesses back to life again. Right. Do this. Ch remind folks on the college end, what is what yeah. is okay and what's not okay in terms of Can't betting? bet on uh, college sports. Uh, well, because I had some political Rutgers, opposition. Rutgers, Seton Hall, can't. Got to lay off that. E even Ohio State and Alabama playing at the Giants Stadium. You can't. can't. Cannot. Because it's in New Jersey. Because it's in New Jersey. And I did it for political reasons. And... Uh, you know about politics. Just Sometimes a little you, bit. You have, to, you have to compromise. So you compromised on that. I compromised, that. yes. So let me ask you this. For those who argue, and by the way, I'm curious about this, because we had yeah. some folks talking about, a lot of talking about um, compulsive gambling issues, people with gambling addiction. Talk about it. Well, first of all, people are gambling anyway. They are gambling offshore internet sites. The FBI And before said that, the mob was making money off it. Three to $500 billion a year, the FBI uh, or says. So it's going on anyway. And at least now we have money, uh, which we are, is dedicated to programs to identify, to help uh, uh, gambling addiction. And by the way, can we put up the website um, for the Lesniak Institute for American Leadership? What is that, Ray, and why is it important? Well, I, I, it's important because I needed something to do after I left the Senate. But I wanted to keep up the, uh, the advocacy for the social justice and criminal justice uh, uh, issues that, that I... you fought for for more for than a couple years. years. For 40 years. 40 years. Yes, yes. So, so what we're doing is we're educating the next generation of American leadership uh, how to advocate uh, for things like criminal justice reform, for protecting animals, for uh, education reforms. And it's... Uh, it's doing a great job, and a lot of students are, are learning how to stand up for what they believe in. You're listening to Senator Ray Lesniak on the audio side. You can see him right now um, in our studio. By the way, check out this book. It's called Beating the Odds. Ray Lesniak tells the story of legalized sports betting in New Jersey. So here I want to do it. I'm going to shift gears. You ready? Sure. As we do this program, just recently our great colleague and friend Brenda Flanagan on NJTV News did a terrific story on the fact that you and your former colleague in the Senate, Joe Carrillo, a Republican, yes. you're a Democrat. You were, who, by the way, what, did the governor ask you to do this? Senator Sweeney asked. Oh, us. excuse me. Okay. <laughs> I'm the sure. Future they, governor. Why don't we just <laughs> stay that. focused? <laughs> no, no. Why don't we stay focused on policy? So yes. you were asked by the Senate president yes. to look at the whole question of tax incentives that the Economic Development Authority, and by the way, check out our interviews about that as well, these tax incentives, what works, what's not working, where are we going too far, who is abusing it, how do we keep it, but keep, have it be better than what it is. Sweeney and Murphy argue about this all the time, in all seriousness. You and Carrillo's came up with what? And by the way, Brenda did a great story about this. Check it out. Well, we've taken uh, Governor Murphy's proposals. We've added things like affordable housing uh, for... Um, um, for job growth that, um, that the governor didn't have in there. Excuse me, so that tax incentives would have to go toward these things? Yes, exactly. And also, for instance, for food deserts. We have uh, poor neighborhoods where folks cannot get healthy foods. They, they get overpriced foods. Uh, and they're, they're not economical to locate supermarkets. So these will be tax incentives to create supermarkets in food deserts so uh, poor folks can have access to uh, healthy food. But, Senator Lesnick, I want to be clear um, whether the proposal, and again, check out NGTV News on this story, I think it might be called uh, Grow 3.0. Here's the thing. How do you, in all seriousness, sure. <clears throat> you and Senator Kurilos, former members of the legislature, serious legislators, got a lot done. How do you do this? How do you propose changes, improvements in these tax incentives without getting caught up in, dare I use the term, petty politics going on often in the State House that has nothing to do with policy and everything to do with personality and other stuff. So Loaded when, question, I know. No, Is yeah, it doable? Yeah. Uh, well, absolutely. If, if there's anybody who can do it, I can. But somebody just told me the other day, so you're the only person who can speak to Senator Sweeney and Governor Murphy. I said, yeah, apparently Joe Krillis and I are. It is doable and it will get done. But why can't they talk to each other more? That's uh, above my pay grade. I wish I knew. <laughs> I've known you over 30 years. First time I ever saw you duck something. <laughs> um, by the way, make sure you check out that story on NJTV News with our great colleague Brenda Flanning. And also make sure you, we can plug. This is good. 
No one's making money on this. Absolutely. Money's, the my, Institute is. That, the, that's right, Institute on Leadership, uh, beating the odds. Uh, Ray, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. All thank the you, best. Steve. Stay right there. That's it for this edition of Think Tank. You want to make sure that you catch something else. It's called Think Tank. That's right, the podcast, Think Tank podcast. It's on Apple Podcasts and Google Play, where you can hear conversations just like this, but also with exclusive commentary available only on Think Tank, the podcast. Watch us here, listen to us online, but most importantly, remember, make sure you think for yourself. I'm Steve Adubato. See you next time. Think Tank with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding has been provided by the law firm of Gibbons PC, Hackensack Meridian Health, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, PSE&G, International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, NJM Insurance Group, Keystone Mountain Lakes Regional Council of Carpenters, and by these public-spirited organizations, individuals, and associations committed to informing New Jersey citizens about the important issues facing the Garden State, and by Employers Association of New Jersey. Promotional support provided by NJ.com and by Insider NJ. Perfectly orchestrated in sync with your life. Hackensack Meridian Health is redefining how health and care come together. Because when everything works together, your world gets better. Hackensack Meridian Health, life years ahead.